The Federal Executive Council on Wednesday, the 24th of June 2020 this year, approved for immediate implementation the 2.3 trillion Naira Nigeria Economic Sustainability Plan. Now, this is a 12-month transit plan between the Economic Recovery and Growth Plan, ERGP, and the ERGP's successor plan, which we understand is currently under consideration. As was reported, uh, this approval was given following thorough deliberation by the ministers. The committee that was charged with the responsibility for the preparation of this plan comprised all the ministers, including the governor of the central bank and the managing director of the NMPC. Well, joining us now from our Abuja studios to discuss the Nigeria Economic Sustainability Plan is Senior Special Assistant to the President on Public Affairs, Ajuri Ngelale. Glad to have you join us on the show today. Many thanks for coming on to Newsday. And I think let's just get right into it. A lot of Nigerians have seen um, the framework for this plan, but there's so many questions that we have. Um, one of them that I want to start with is that we have been told that a minimum of 1,000 Nigerians will be recruited in every single local government area, leading to a minimum of 774,000 jobs. Now, this, of course, is for infrastructural purposes, building of roads, etc. How do you plan on training or how does the government plan on training this number of people? And what is the recruitment process for this going to be? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, let me start by saying I'm always humbled by the privilege of being uh, with you on this platform, uh, and thank you very much for having me. Uh, you, you see, when we look at uh, the Economic Sustainability Plan, I think it's important to just note uh, that this 2.3 trillion Naira uh, economic stimulus uh, is, is, is finite in the sense that uh, it is occurring within a specific window, which we've given, which is 12 months. And uh, when we talk about you know, the various component parts of the program, the special public works program, which is what you have referenced with the 1,000 young people being recruited from every single local government area of the Federation, just one component of the program, but really emphasizes the president's priority uh, and the vice president, Professor Yemi Oshibajo's priority uh, at ensuring that there's equity in terms of distribution of spread of jobs and benefits in the program. Now, as to your question about the uh, recruitment and training, uh, we have already proven uh, that uh, as an administration, we know how to massively employ and equip uh, our young people with skills. We've done it, obviously, with the 516,000 uh, who benefited from the NPOWER program across various sectors. Uh, and we're going to do it again with the Special Public Works program. Now, with this process, uh, in terms of recruitment, uh, the president was adamant that, indeed, uh, this, like NPOWER, must be engaged in a manner that is totally nonpartisan. Uh, he is committed to ensuring that as the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, that every citizen of the Federal Republic of Nigeria has equal access uh, to the dividends of democracy due to them. Uh, and that is no different in this program. So uh, we've set up uh, through the uh, Ministry of Labor and Employment and the Peristato, the Na uh, Niger National Director for Employment, NDE, that's handling this program. They've set up state selection committees comprising of nonpartisan individuals, Nigerians of repute, uh, that include the state chairman of the respective states of the Christian Association of Nigeria, the state chairman of the respective Islamic authorities uh, in all of the states, and other critical stakeholders from the academia uh, and, and, and other, uh, you know, uh, apolitical institutions. So we are determined to ensure that every Nigerian, irrespective of affiliation, whether it be ethnic, whether it be faith, whether it be political, uh, that they're able to access all components of the program, including the special public works program that you mentioned. And I should add that with the special public works program, we're not just prioritizing through the components of the, of the NESP, uh, the issue of equity of spread of benefits. We're also prioritizing the use of only Nigerian companies who will employ only Nigerian labor, who will use only Nigerian raw materials. So this special public works program is going to have our young people uh, reconstructing internal rural roads that link farms to markets, in industries to ports, using bitumen sourced from Nigeria to reconstruct our roads, for example. So it's a very well thought out, a very meticulously arranged plan. And it's going to have maximal impact, not just on the livelihoods of our people, but the Nigerian economy at large. All right, Ajuri, you've just taken the words out of my mouth. Very thought out and very meticulous and articulate plan there. But people, some, 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 some pessimists will look at this and say that pre, prior to or pre-COVID-19 era, things like this were being thrown out to the public and it did not find the light of the day, or it did not gain full expression, or it did not come to full fruition. And people are saying that now that we've seen COVID-19 ravage the economy, 
What is the guarantee that in dire times like this, we'll have this elaborate plan come to full fruition whereby Nigerians from almost all sectors, from infrastructure to technology, you've mentioned the youths, you've mentioned schools, will be able to benefit and lift Nigeria from the ruins that we found ourselves, no thanks to the economic impact of COVID-19. Uh, thank you very much, my brother, uh, for that very important question. Uh, indeed, I have heard uh, some of the criticism uh, about the NESP, uh, really uh, focusing in on some of the inadequacies of the uh, uh, previous uh, Economic Recovery and Growth Plan, ERGP. Uh, and I want to make it very, very clear that we have to situate the context appropriately when we compare uh, the Economic Sustainability Plan of 2020 uh, with the ERGP of 2017 to 2020. What do I mean by that? Uh, when we were putting in place the ERGP, and many targets, by the way, we, we achieved, by the way, but those we did not achieve, uh, it, it's, it's true that we did not achieve them, but it's extremely important to note that the major difference between what was occurring then and what is occurring now was at that time, you would recall that you had major crises uh, in the 8th National Assembly, where we had an unprecedented set of budget padding scandals. You had lawmakers diverting hundreds of billions of naira away from critical infrastructure projects that were critical to the implementation of the ERGP uh, and diverting those into uh, buying tricycles in their constituencies and all of the nonsense that we were seeing. You also know that there was a political crisis in the National Assembly uh, in which uh, the budget that was supposed to be running from January to December was held, into, held onto by the National Assembly until June, July, uh, before the president was even in a position to sign it into effect. That had, an impl that had real impact on our ability to ensure that contractors are mobilized in time and they're supposed to be getting their work done on time for the funds that were there, not to speak of the funds that were being diverted away uh, from the projects. And we all know that in the 8th National Assembly, there were leader, uh, members of the leadership who were adamant that President Mohamedou Buhari was not going to achieve certain infrastructure development ahead of the 2019 uh, general election because of the politics they think they were playing at the time. What we have in the, under the NESP, the difference, is we, we are working with a ninth National Assembly that has already, not by words but by action, has already regularized uh, the budget cycle from January to December for the first time in over 10 years. They are working with us with our budgets. They're not diverting funds away from the budgets, uh, you know, to, to, to buy tricycles in their constituencies and all of that. And, and we have some level of uh, consensus. Now, they're still in a position to independently tell us that this is going wrong. We think you can do it this way because that's their job. But they're doing it in a responsible and patriotic manner, and I think they should be applauded for that. So that is the difference between what was going on before and our, our ability to implement the NESP now. Aside from that, we already have funding in place. Uh, we have the 500 billion naira that was approved by the National Assembly in the form of the COVID-19 relief fund. We also were able to secure 3.4 billion dollars from the International Monetary Fund uh, by withdrawing the co membership dues and contributions we have made over a series of years. They allow developing countries to, in time of economic crisis to withdraw those funds, to deal with the crisis, to pay those back uh, later. And so we've been able to do that. And we also have $2.5 billion uh, from the World Bank we were able to secure in low interest concessional funding. So the 2.3 trillion Naira is on ground. We have secured the funding. We have the support of the National Assembly. And as a result, there is absolutely no excuse as to why uh, the NESP will not be successfully implemented. And the last point I want to make quickly is that President Mohamedou Buhari, in his wisdom, designated, uh, stipulated that uh, Pre uh, Vice President Professor Yemi Oshibajo and his team, who designed the plan, will now be in charge of overseeing the implementation of the plan to ensure that what was envisaged is manifest on the ground in the wards and local governments and communities all across this nation. Thanks. I mean, it sounds all well and good, but I'm, I'm going to come back to the finances of this with you. That is something that I want us to break down further. There are lots of questions that I have about that. But I want us to go back to discussing a couple of the details that we see inside this NESP. I'm going to take you up on agriculture now, because it's been stated that the government aims to ensure the cultivation of between 20 to 100,000 uh, hectares of new farmland in every single state. Now, while that does sound great, 
What is the specific plan in terms of how the government aims to, cul uh, to cultivate this land? Is it going to be given to people for free, leased to people? Is the government going to be giving people seedlings and other agricultural machinery that they may need? We, we, there are not many details that I can see on that in the plan. The only mention that I can see is low interest credit for the cultivation of this land. Can you give us more details? Yes, I, I, absolutely. Thank you very much for getting into the nitty gritty of it. Uh, so I, I'm hoping before the end of this program, we can actually touch a little bit on each of the segments. I'm but since so you mentioned too. agriculture, <laughs> one of the major, one, uh, yeah, one of the major challenges we've had is that in terms of some of these economic plans from the, from, the, from the federal government coming down and being manifest on the ground the way that they are intended to, has been a divergence between what the federal government envisions and what the state governments are, enab are enabling to occur on the ground in partnership with the federal government. In the past, Abuja will you know, release an economic plan and state governments are not carried along. So what the vice president and his team did very intentionally from the beginning was to engaged because he's also chairman of the National Economic Council. He worked very closely with all state governors of the federation and said, look, what are the peculiarities in your various states that need to be taken into account across the component parts of this plan to ensure that what we're talking about now in Abuja is going to be on the ground in your localities. And those issues have been mashed out. They have been addressed. They've been hashed out. Now, so they, in, 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 uh, across those consultations, the state governments agreed that they were going to supply between, like you said, 20,000, 100,000 hectares of land. And in exchange, the federal government would employ millions of young people within the localities across the country uh, to not just clear but cultivate the land. But the cultivation is targeting high value export commodities like cash crops such as cashew, cocoa, uh, sesame seed and others that can really get us the, the most bang for our buck, so to speak. But the clearing process, which is what you touched, is going to obviously in involve the partnership of Nigerian, and I want to emphasize that because everything we're doing is with Nigerian companies who will employ Nigerian labor. That is the essence of the plan. Nigerian companies will, of course, come in and partner with us in terms of bringing in some of the, the, uh, the machinery required uh, to, in, to conduct the clearing process using Nigerian labor and, where necessary, Nigerian raw materials. So that's that. And then, of course, the cultivation uh, is the second leg of it. But the land is coming from the, the state governments uh, essentially free of charge. Our is to make sure that we have the, the labor uh, on the ground, Nigerians getting the jobs, young Nigerians, so that we can create a cross-generational exchange of uh, expertise from the, the mo most of the farming class now is middle, class, uh, uh, middle age to upper middle age. So now we're trying to transfer that to the next generation for sustainability. So all of that uh, is factored into the plan and the private sector will be involved. All right, um, Ajuri, let's focus on one of them that you mentioned, of course, investment into the healthcare infrastructure and also one that actually tickled my fancy, talking about the installation of solar home systems. And you said that you're targeting 5 million households and serving about 25 million individuals, uh, individual Nigerians. I want to find out how, what's the timeline for some of these key things? The infrastructure you've mentioned for the installation of solar healthcare um, investment into healthcare infrastructure. Is there a timeline people should be expecting Thank these you. things to kick in yeah. and be completed? Or are we just looking at it just being a rolling investment program? Yes, thank you very much. Another, gr another great question from you. Uh, well, we, everything is finite, right? That's why we're, we're coming out up front and saying this is a 12-month plan. That does not mean that the jobs that, that are created within this plan will disappear after 12 months. The jobs that we're creating, we want them to be sustainable beyond the 12-month period, of course. Uh, but what we're doing and what we're putting on ground is, is being put on ground within 12 months. So let me uh, break it down per component that you mentioned. On the housing scheme, we've been very open and clear with our people that the target now is to, create, is to build 300,000 houses across all states of the Federation with an equitable number of houses in each state. 300,000 in 12 months uh, using Nigerian raw materials, of course, Nigerian labor, uh, etc. Now, in terms of the solar, uh, solar power program, we are uh, hiring 250,000 young people, including young engineers in this country, who are going to be involved in the process of assembling, distributing, and most importantly, maintaining 
5 million solar home systems. Now, those solar home systems are not all going to just be placed in, uh, in, in, in rural homes. What we're doing very strategically under the leadership of the vice president, he said, look, how can we take this solar power opportunity and, and maximize the impact of it on the larger economy? And so what we're doing is we're targeting rural farms. Why are we doing that? Rural farms uh, have been reputed in this country uh, for suffering massive uh, post-harvest losses. Uh, one, uh, one major reason for that is a lack of refrigeration capacity in their storage facilities because of lack of power. So what we're doing is we're saying, look, the president has made so many investments in our farmers through the Anchor Borrowers Program, providing uh, millions of low interest credit facilities to our farmers, providing seedlings, slashing the price of fertilizer in half by revitalizing over 31 fertilizer blending plants nationwide. He has done all of that to enhance production. But the question now is about one they produce, how can they get those things to market without having them massively spoiled so that they're not just taking 50% of, of their goods to market, but 100%. So with these solar home systems, we're going to be able to give our rural farms nationwide in all of the states uh, the 24 hours uh, you know, power capacity to allow them to refrigerate effectively for storage ahead of movement uh, to the markets. We're also going to be putting these solar home systems in our rural uh, primary schools, ru rural primary health care centers, which is very strategic, and we're targeting rural MSMEs in addition uh, to rural homes. And it's important to note that the, uh, the 5 million systems is just phase one of, of the larger project, we are, uh, which is going to impact 25 million rural dwellers. We want to eventually get it to the point of about 25 million uh, solar home systems over the course of the next uh, five or six years. So, so everything you're seeing in this plan deals with 12 months, but everything is phase one. Even the housing I talked about is 300,000 houses in the first year. That is phase one of a larger plan that is going to be 1.8 million social homes over the, the next uh, uh, you know, five or six years. And I think it's important to mention, when we talk about uh, housing, for example, it's one thing to construct affordable housing. It's another thing to get those homes in the hands of Nigerians so that uh, the most vulnerable of our people are able to access those homes. So what we've done is after the 300,000 are constructed, we have already arranged for the Central Bank of Nigeria to come in and offtake these homes. That means paying the contractors so that they're released, right? And then once we've done that, we're going to now open it up to a vetting process where you have to have a certain income uh, threshold to be able to be uh, eligible to own these homes. What do I mean by that? We are targeting minimum wage earners and middle income earners. So if you are earning from 20,000 naira a month uh, to, for example, or 30,000 naira in a month to about, I think about 700,000 or so middle income, then you are going to be eligible for these homes. So you're going to go through an automated process. You're going to submit your BVN, your bank account information. We'll audit your accounts to make sure that your economic status is what you say it is. And then on the basis of that, we're going to offer you mortgage payments of between 25,000 Naira and 35,000 Naira a month until you own the house. So we're not just dealing with construction, we're also dealing with making sure that it is affordable for our people to own these social homes. And government is not looking to make a couple in profit on these homes. We just want to create the jobs and create the homes uh, for our people. And that is the drive of this administration. Okay, Anna, what interest rate can we actually expect uh, people to pay back for these homes at? So that is a question I was going to bring up to you, but more so I wanted us to discuss the increase in broadband connectivity uh, before we run out of time because that is another thing that has been mentioned on the NESP and it took me back to Equity State and how Equity State were able to reduce the right of way uh, for broadband connectivity. Can we expect that to happen nationwide? Thank you, thank you so much. Well, we, we've already done uh, an extensive amount of work on that. Let me start from your first question, which has to do with the interest rate. In everything we're doing in terms of lending within the NESP, almost all of the programs are interest-free. And even the ones with interest, it's, it's negligible. It's less than 1% on, on most of them. Uh, so that's that. That cuts across. Even the MSME, and that's a major part of this, is the MSME interventions. We're about to launch uh, the MSME intervention of the NESP, which is going to involve uh, the payment uh, of, of grants not even loans. They're not going to have to pay them back at all uh, to over 300,000 MSME, uh, MSMEs across the country in a survival fund that's going to protect 1 million jobs uh, to avoid them from being uh, laid off through this uh, MSME uh, support. But with that said, you mentioned broadband. Broadband is a major emphasis of this administration already. Uh, the NCC has uh, almost doubled our broadband capacity from what it was in 2015. And the president has been very clear that we are going to get broadband penetration in this country from where it is now 
now at approximately, give or take 30, 40%, I would have to double check, uh, to 70% by 2023. And that has involved massive investment quietly uh, in, uh, through, uh, through the NCC in cabling across the country. You're right that Ekiti State is just one out of many states uh, that have worked effectively with the Ministry of Communications and Digital Economy uh, under the leadership of Dr. Pantami to reduce uh, the cost of right-of-way uh, charges so that uh, they can uh, abet and uh, you know, assist the process of cabling investment across their states. Uh, Quara is also another state that has done very well in that regard, Lagos and many others. So we're continuing to have the buy-in of the state governments uh, in terms of how we're going to ensure that we expand uh, our broadband uh, capacity uh, under uh, not just this plan, but in, even in the larger economic plan uh, that will eventually succeed uh, the Nigerian Economic Sustainability Plan. I think it's important to mention before I go very quickly that under this plan, there's a, there's a plan that is very close to the, to the heart of the vice president and the president, uh, which is the, uh, the, the, the future of technology, which is the establishment of uh, digital operation centers across the country, where we're going to employ one million young people, separate from all of the other employment uh, we've talked about. Uh, and they're going to be involved in making government and the private sector more accessible. What do I mean by that? You'll find that if you go on a government website, you will see a phone number from NITEL from 1997 that does, not, that does not work anymore. Outdated information and all of that. So what we're doing, NPower taught us, and FIRS and NCDC since COVID-19 taught us that we can actually establish these call centers where people can call in and get real-time information about government policies and troubleshooting and data management and all of these things to make government more accessible. So with, through the NCC and the Ministry of Communications and Digital Economy, we're going to be establishing uh, these uh, call centers across all the geopolitical zones of the country, where one million young people will be trained uh, to uh, essentially be troubleshooters. Uh, uh, yes. All right, I would have loved to speak to you about um, cutting non-essential costs and spending, but we're so out of time right now. I want to say thank you very much for joining us today. I will hope to catch up with you okay. in, in the future. Uh, keep up the good work.